The Swift Programming Language 5.6 edition, copyrighted by Apple and made available under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Properties. Properties associate values with a particular class, structure, or enumeration. Stored properties store constant and variable values as part of an instance, whereas computed properties calculate, rather than store, a value. Computed properties are provided by classes, structures, and enumerations. Stored properties are provided only by classes and structures. Stored and computed properties are usually associated with instances of a particular type. However, properties can also be associated with the type itself. Such properties are known as type properties. In addition, you can define property observers to monitor changes in a property's value, which you can respond to with custom actions. Property observers can be added to stored properties you define yourself and also to properties that a subclass inherits from its superclass. You can also use a property wrapper to reuse code in the getter and setter of multiple properties. Stored properties. In its simplest form, a stored property is a constant or variable that is stored as part of an instance of a particular class or structure. Stored properties can be either variable stored properties introduced by the var keyword or constant stored properties introduced by the let keyword. You can provide a default value for a stored property as part of its definition as described in default property values. You can also set and modify the initial value for a stored property during initialization. This is true even for constant stored properties as described in assigning constant properties during initialization. This example defines a structure called fixed length range, which describes a range of integers whose range length cannot be changed after it is created. Instances of fixed length range have a variable stored property called first value and a constant stored property called length. In this example, length is initialized when the new range is created and cannot be changed thereafter because it is a constant stored property. Stored properties of constant structure instances. If you create an instance of a structure and assign that instance to a constant, you cannot modify the instance properties even if they were declared as variable properties. Because range of four items is declared as a constant with the let keyword, it is not possible to change its first value property even though first value is a variable property. This behavior is due to structures being value types. When an instance of a value type is marked as a constant, so are all of its properties. This is not true for classes, which are reference types. If you assign an instance of a reference type to a constant, you can still change that instance's variable properties. Lazy stored properties. A lazy stored property is a property whose initial value is not calculated until the first time it is used. You indicate a lazy stored property by writing the lazy modifier before its declaration. Note, you must always declare a lazy property as a variable with the var keyword because its initial value might not be retrieved until after instance initialization completes. Constant properties must always have a value before initialization completes and therefore cannot be declared as lazy. Lazy properties are useful when the initial value for a property is dependent on outside factors whose values are not known until after an instance's initialization is complete. Lazy properties are also useful when the initial value for a property requires complex or computationally expensive setup that should not be performed unless or until it is needed. This example uses a lazy stored property to avoid unnecessary initialization of a complex class. This example defines two classes called data importer and data manager, neither of which is shown in full. The data manager class has a stored property called data, which is initialized with the new empty array of string values. Although the rest of its functionality is not shown, the purpose of this data manager class is to manage and provide access to this array of string data. Part of the functionality of the data manager class is to import data from a file. This functionality is provided by the data importer class, which is assumed to take a non-trivial amount of time to initialize. This might be because a data importer instance needs to open a file and read its contents into memory when the data importer instance is initialized. 
Because it is possible for a data manager instance to manage its data without ever importing data from a file, data manager does not create a new data importer instance when the data manager itself is created. Instead, it makes more sense to create the data importer instance if and when it is first used. Because it is marked with the lazy modifier, the data importer instance for the importer property is only created when the importer property is first accessed, such as when its file name property is queried. Note, if a property marked with the lazy modifier is accessed by multiple threads simultaneously and the property has not yet been initialized, there is no guarantee that the property will be initialized only once. Stored properties and instance variables. If you have experience with Objective-C, you may know that it provides you two ways to store values and references as part of a class instance. In addition to properties, you can use instance variables as a backing store for the values stored in a property. Swift unifies these concepts into a single property declaration. A Swift property does not have a corresponding instance variable, and the backing store for a property is not accessed directly. This approach avoids confusion about how the value is accessed in different contexts and simplifies the property's declaration into a single, definitive statement. All information about the property, including its name, type, and memory management characteristics, is defined in a single location as part of the type's definition. Computed properties. In addition to stored properties, classes, structures, and enumerations can define computed properties which do not actually store a value. Instead, they provide a getter and an optional setter to retrieve and set other properties and values indirectly. This example defines three structures for working with geometric shapes. Point encapsulates the X and Y coordinate of a point. Size encapsulates a width and a height. Rect defines a rectangle by an origin point and a size. The rect structure also provides a computed property called center. The current center position of a rect can always be determined from its origin and size, and so you do not need to store the center point as an explicit point value. Instead, the rect defines a custom getter and setter for a computed variable called center to enable you to work with the rectangle center as if it were a real stored property. The example creates a new rect variable called square. The square variable is initialized with an origin point of 0, 0, and a width and a height of 10. The square is represented by the light green square in the diagram. The square variable center property is then accessed through dot syntax, square.center, which causes the getter for center to be called to retrieve the current property value. Rather than returning an existing value, the getter actually calculates and returns a new point to represent the center of the square. As can be seen, the getter correctly returns a center point of 5, 5. The center property is then set to a new value of 15, 15, which moves the square up and to the right to the new position showed by the dark green square in the diagram. Setting the center property calls the setter for center, which modifies the x and y values of the stored origin property and moves the square to its new position. Shorthand setter declaration. If a computed property setter does not define a name for the new value to be set, a default name of new value is used. Here is an alternative version of the rec structure that takes advantage of this shorthand notation. Shorthand getter declaration. If the entire body of a getter is a single expression, the getter implicitly returns that expression. This is another version of the rec structure that takes advantage of this shorthand notation and the shorthand notation for setters. Omitting the return from a getter follows the same rules as omitting return from a function, as described in functions with an implicit return. Read-only computed properties. A computed property with a getter but no setter is known as a read-only computed property. A read-only computed property always returns a value and can be accessed through dot syntax but cannot be set to a different value. Note, you must declare computed properties, including read-only computed properties, with the var keyword because their value is not fixed. The let keyword is only used for constant properties to indicate that their values cannot be changed once they are set as part of instance initialization. You can simplify the declaration of a read-only computed property by removing the get keyword and its braces. 
This example defines a new structure called cuboid, which represents a 3D rectangular box with width, height, and depth properties. This structure also has a read-only computed property called volume, which calculates and returns the current volume of the cuboid. It does not make sense for volume to be settable because it would be ambiguous as to which values of width, height, and depth should be used for a particular volume value. Nonetheless, it is useful for a cuboid to provide a read-only computed property to enable external users to discover its current calculated volume. Property Observers Property observers observe and respond to changes in a property's value. Property observers are called every time a property's value is set, even if the new value is the same as the property's current value. You can add property observers in the following places. Stored properties that you define. Stored properties that you inherit. Computed properties that you inherit. For an inherited property, you add a property observer by overriding that property in a subclass. For a computed property that you define, use the properties setter to observe and respond to value changes instead of trying to create an observer. Overriding properties is described in overriding. You have the option to define either or both of these observers on a property. Will set is called just before the value is stored. Did set is called immediately after the new value is stored. If you implement a will set observer, it is passed the new property value as a constant parameter. You can specify a name for this parameter as part of your will set implementation. If you do not write the parameter name and parentheses within your implementation, the parameter is made available with the default parameter name of new value. Similarly, if you implement a did set observer, it is passed a constant parameter containing the old property value. You can name the parameter or use the default parameter name of old value. If you assign a value to a property within its own did set observer, the new value that you assign replaces the one that was just set. Note, the will set and did set observers of superclass properties are called when a property is set in a subclass initializer after the superclass initializer has been called. They are not called while the class is setting its own properties before the superclass initializer has been called. For more information about initializer delegation, see initializer delegation for value types and initializer delegation for class types. Here is an example of will set and did set in action. The example defines a new class called step counter, which tracks the total number of steps that a person takes while walking. This class might be used with input data from a pedometer or other step counter to keep track of a person's exercise during their daily routine. The step counter class declares a total steps property of type int. This is a stored property with will set and did set observers. The will set and did set observers for total steps are called whenever the property is assigned a new value. This is true even if the new value is the same as the current value. This example's will set observer uses a custom parameter name of new total steps for the upcoming new value. In this example, it simply prints out the value that is about to be set. The did set observer is called after the value of total steps is updated. It compares the new value of total steps against the old value. If the total number of steps has increased, a message is printed to indicate how many new steps have been taken. The did set observer does not provide a custom parameter name for the old value and the default name of old value is used instead. Note. If you pass a property that has observers to a function as an in-out parameter, the will set and did set observers are always called. This is because of the copy in, copy out memory model for in-out parameters. The value is always written back to the property at the end of the function. For a detailed discussion of the behavior of in-out parameters, see in-out parameters. Property wrappers. A property wrapper adds a layer of separation between code that manages how a property is stored and the code that defines a property. For example, if you have properties that provide thread safety checks or store their underlying value in a database, you have to write that code on every property. When you use a property wrapper, you write the management code once when you define the wrapper and then reuse that management code by applying it to multiple properties. To define a property wrapper, you make a structure, enumeration, or class that defines a wrapped value property. In the code below, the 12 or less structure ensures that the value it wraps always contains a number less than or equal to 12. If you ask it to store a larger number, it stores 12 instead. 
The setter ensures that new values are less than or equal to 12, and the getter returns the stored value. Note, the declaration for number in the example above marks the variable as private, which ensures number is used only in the implementation of 12 or less. Code that is written anywhere else accesses the value using the getter and setter for wrapped value and cannot use number directly. For more information about private, see access control. You apply a wrapper to a property by writing the wrapper's name before the property as an attribute. Here is a structure that stores a rectangle that uses the 12 or less property wrapper to ensure its dimensions are always 12 or less. The height and width properties get their initial values from the definition of 12 or less, which sets 12 or less dot number to zero. The setter in 12 or less treats 10 as a valid value, so storing the number in 10 in rectangle dot height proceeds as written. However, 24 is larger than 12 or less allows, so trying to store 24 ends up setting rectangle dot height to 12 instead, the largest allowed value. When you apply a wrapper to a property, the compiler synthesizes code that provides storage for the wrapper and code that provides access to the property through the wrapper. The property wrapper is responsible for storing the wrapped value, so there is no synthesized code for that. You could write code that uses the behavior of a property wrapper without taking advantage of the special attribute syntax. For example, here is a version of small rectangle from the previous code listing that wraps its properties in the 12 or less structure explicitly instead of writing at 12 or less as an attribute. The underscore height and underscore width properties store an instance of the property wrapper 12 or less. The getter and setter for height and width wrap access to the wrapped value property. Setting initial values for wrapped properties. The code in the examples prior set the initial value for the wrapped property by giving number an initial value in the definition of 12 or less. Code that uses that property wrapper cannot specify a different initial value for a property that is wrapped by 12 or less. For example, the definition of small rectangle could not give height or width initial values. To support setting an initial value or other customization, the property wrapper needs to add an initializer. Here is an expanded version of 12 or less called small number that defines initializers that set the wrapped and maximum value. This definition of small number includes three initializers, init, init wrap value, and init wrap value maximum, which the examples below use to set the wrap value and the maximum value. For information about initialization and initializer syntax, see initialization. When you apply a wrapper to a property and you do not specify an initial value, Swift uses the init initializer to set up the wrapper. The instances of small number that wrap height and width are created by calling small number with no arguments. The code inside that initializer sets the initial wrapped value and the initial maximum value using the default values of 0 and 12. The property wrapper still provides all the initial values, like the earlier example that used 12 or less in small rectangle. Unlike that example, small number also supports writing those initial values as part of declaring the property. When you specify an initial value for the property, Swift uses the init wrapped value initializer to set up the wrapper. When you write equal one on a property with a wrapper, that is translated into a call to the init wrapped value initializer. The instances of small number that wrap height and width are created by calling small number wrapped value one. The initializer uses the wrapped value that is specified here and uses the default maximum value of 12. When you write arguments in parentheses after the custom attribute, Swift uses the initializer that accepts those arguments to set up the wrapper. For example, if you provide an initial value and a maximum value, Swift uses the init wrapped value maximum initializer. The instance of small number that wraps height is created by calling small number wrapped value two maximum five, and the instance that wraps width is created by calling small number wrapped value three maximum four. By including arguments to the property wrapper, you can set up the initial state in the wrapper or pass other options to the wrapper when it is created. This syntax is the most general way to use a property wrapper. You can provide whatever arguments you need to the attribute and they are passed to the initializer. When you include property wrapper arguments, you can also specify an initial value using assignment. 
Swift treats the assignment like a wrapped value argument and uses the initializer that accepts the arguments you include. The instance of small number that wraps height is created by calling small number wrapped value 1, which uses the default maximum value of 12. The instance that wraps width is created by calling small number wrapped value 2, maximum 9. Projecting a value from a property wrapper. In addition to the wrapped value, a property wrapper can expose additional functionality by defining a projected value. For example, a property wrapper that manages access to a database can expose a flush database connection method on its projected value. The name of the projected value is the same as the wrapped value, except it begins with a dollar sign. Because your code cannot define properties that start with the dollar sign, the projected value never interferes with properties you define. In the small number example, if you try to set the property to a number that is too large, the property wrapper adjusts the number before storing it. This code adds a projected value property to the small number structure to keep track of whether the property wrapper adjusted the new value for the property before storing that new value. Writing some structure dot dollar sign some number accesses the wrapper's projected value. After storing a small number like four, the value is false. However, the projected value is true after trying to store a number that is too large like 55. A property wrapper can return a value of any type as its projected value. In this example, the property wrapper exposes only one piece of information, whether the number was adjusted, so it exposes that Boolean value as its projected value. A wrapper that needs to expose more information can return an instance of some other data type, or it can return self to expose the instance of the wrapper as its own projected value. When you access a projected value from code that is part of the type, like a property getter or an instance method, you can omit self before the property name, just like accessing other properties. The code in this example refers to the projected value of the wrapper around height and width as dollar sign $height and dollar sign $width. Because property wrapper syntax is just syntactic sugar for a property with a getter and a setter, accessing height and width behaves the same as accessing any other property. For example, the code in resize2 accesses height and width using their property wrapper. If you call resize2.large, the switch case for .large sets the rectangle's height and width to 100. The wrapper prevents the value of these properties from being larger than 12, and it sets the projected value to true to record the fact that it adjusted their values. At the end of resize2, the return statement checks dollar sign $height and dollar sign $width to determine whether the property wrapper adjusted either height or width. Global and local variables. The capabilities described above for computing and observing properties are also available to global variables and local variables. Global variables are variables that are defined outside of any function, method, closure, or type context. Local variables are variables that are defined within a function, method, or closure context. The global and local variables you have encountered in previous chapters have all been stored variables. Stored variables, like stored properties, provide storage for a value of a certain type and allow that value to be set and retrieved. However, you can also define computed variables and define observers for stored variables in either a global or local scope. Computed variables calculate their value rather than storing it, and they are written in the same way as computed properties. Note, Global constants and variables are always computed lazily in a similar manner to lazy stored properties. Unlike lazy stored properties, global constants and variables do not need to be marked with the lazy modifier. Local constants and variables are never computed lazily. You can apply a property wrapper to a local stored variable, but not to a global variable or a computed variable. For example, in the code below, my number uses small number as a property wrapper. Like when you apply small number to a property, setting the value of my number to 10 is valid. Because the property wrapper does not allow values higher than 12, it sets my number to 12 instead of 24. Type properties. Instance properties are properties that belong to an instance of a particular type. Every time you create a new instance of that type, it has its own set of property values separate from any other instance. 
You can also define properties that belong to the type itself, not to any one instance of that type. There will only ever be one copy of these properties, no matter how many instances of that type you create. These kinds of properties are called type properties. Type properties are useful for defining values that are universal to all instances of a particular type, such as a constant property that all instances can use, like a static constant in C, or a variable property that stores a value that is global to all instances of that type, like a static variable in C. Stored type properties can be variables or constants. Computed type properties are always declared as variable properties in the same way as computed instance properties. Note, unlike stored instance properties, you must always give stored type properties a default value. This is because the type itself does not have an initializer that can assign a value to a stored type property at initialization time. Stored type properties are lazily initialized on their first access. They are guaranteed to be initialized only once, even when accessed by multiple threads simultaneously, and they do not need to be marked with the lazy modifier. Type property syntax. In C and Objective-C, you define static constants and variables associated with a type as global static variables. In Swift, however, type properties are written as part of the type's definition within the type's outer curly braces, and each type property is explicitly scoped to the type it supports. You define type properties with the static keyword. For computed type properties for class types, you can use the class keyword instead to allow subclasses to override the superclasses implementation. This example shows the syntax for stored and computed type properties. Note, the computed type properties examples here are for read-only computed type properties, but you can also define read-write computed type properties with the same syntax as for computed instance properties. Querying and setting type properties. Type properties are queried and set with dot syntax, just like instance properties. However, type properties are queried and set on the type, not on the instance of the type. This example uses two stored type properties as part of a structure that models an audio level meter for a number of audio channels. Each channel has an integer audio level between 0 and 10 inclusive. This figure illustrates how two of these audio channels can be combined to model a stereo audio level meter. When a channel's audio level is zero, none of the lights for that channel are lit. When the audio level is 10, all of the lights for that channel are lit. In this figure, the left channel has a current level of nine and the right channel has a current level of seven. The audio channels are represented by instances of the audio channel structure. The audio channel structure defines two stored type properties to support its functionality. The first, threshold level, defines the maximum threshold value an audio level can take. This is a constant value of 10 for all audio channel instances. If an audio signal comes in with a higher value than 10, it will be capped to this threshold value as described below. The second type property is a variable stored property called max input level for all channels. This keeps track of the maximum input value that has been received by any audio channel instance. It starts with an initial value of zero. The audio channel structure also defines a stored instance property called current level, which represents the channel's current audio level on a scale of zero to 10. The current level property has a did set property observer to check the value of current level whenever it is set. This observer performs two checks. If the new value of current level is greater than the allowed threshold level, the property observer caps current level to the threshold level. If the new value of current level, after any capping, is higher than any value previously received by any audio channel instance, the property observer stores the new current level value in the max input level for all channels type property. Note, in the first of these two checks, the did set observer sets current level to a different value. This does not, however, cause the observer to be called again. You can use the audio channel structure to create two new audio channels called left channel and right channel to represent the audio levels of a stereo sound system. If you set the current level of the left channel to seven, you can see that the max input level for all channels type property is updated to equal seven.
If you try to set the current level of the right channel to 11, you can see that the right channel's current level property is capped to the maximum level of 10, and the max input level for all channels type property is updated to equal 10.